paid on elk, but the elk, uh, you know, got conditioned to wolves and didn't loiter around as much. They got a lot more defensive and they stayed away from overgrazing stream banks. And in so doing, the banks restored a lot of vegetation, which gave the stream a lot of shade, which cooled the stream down and made it habitat for these rare trout and native trout and so on. So it just, it's recent, it's a recent study that shows, you know, how interconnected things are. We can say everything's interconnected and have a general sense of that, but it's highly quantified <laughs> with this reintroduction of wolves. And then on the downside, my buddy Tim uh, is in charge of wolf reintroduction in Wisconsin. And he said, you know, they were really coming along. They were reproducing and so on. But um, these deer hunters lobbied their senators. And he said when the data showed that wolves were about one third of the population they need to be and deer are about 15 times the population they should be. And they're having a dramatic negative effect on the forests that they've now reintroduced the hunting season on wolves. And he, and he tongue in cheek says, you know, that, you know, whatever a Bubba is in Wisconsin, they wanna sit on a stump with a cigar. And if they don't shoot a 12 point every day, there's not enough deer. So, you know, he's, he's just beside himself with the idea of environmental education. Like, look at the data. Wolves need to be three times more and deer 15 times less but you want to shoot wolves and have more deer. So that, that's just a perception thing that is a reality in Wisconsin and many other parts of the country. Nice. Um, I am going to, because I forgot to hit record, <laughs> I'm going to quickly recap what I said at the very beginning of, of this. Um, uh, this evening, we're doing our makeup session of Thinking Like a Mountain from a Sand County Almanac. And um, basically I, I said earlier that did not get recorded, oopsie, um, is that this this particular excerpt is the is where Leopold has his green fire moment um, and that, that shift in consciousness when he sees the uh, green fire dying in the wolf's eye that he realizes um, that killing all the wolves is is not um, it's actually do it, it does more damage than good. And um, then I said that it's it's kind of a metaphor for many things in life, and that I I have my green fire moments every other week, and I I jokingly quip that. Um, you know, I just had green fire moment not number nine hundred and eighty four, um, but that's that's basically um, what we're discussing this evening. And um, then uh, Bill had some really good stuff to say, um, and that's that's all. So, anybody else want to um, give some thoughts on this? I will. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. I'll wait. Go ahead, Russell. Okay, I gotcha. Um, yeah, I I agree with uh, Bill's sentiment. I feel like um, in a lot of ways, the 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 PR of wolves is just such an uphill battle, um, and it 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 makes no sense why they're thought of in such a um, I guess like a harmful and dangerous light, both like to people and ecosystems and to to game and wildlife. Um, but, you know, I've been daydreaming about, uh, you know, the reintroduction of uh, wolves here in Alabama one day, which would be awfully cool, but I probably will not get to see in my lifetime. Um, yeah, and I just um, just thoughts about how the reintroduction would uh, benefit the health of our forests and the ecosystem at large. Okay, Nancy, go ahead. Thank you. I think this is fun. We need more of these kinds of rap sessions. 
So um, I was a career visual arts teacher in, in public school. I did interdisciplinary art lessons and we got a $20,000 grant from the state of Alabama Department of Ed for interdisciplinary arts and core curriculum subjects. So I had already been doing it anyway. And one of my favorite units was on, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the wolf and the biology of the wolf, the pack structure, um, all of the above, some things that Bill mentioned about the wolf's role in the ecosystem. When you take away the wolf, uh, it, you know, and when I was in Yellowstone in the mid 90s after they reintroduced the gray wolf, it was fascinating because we were in our tent and Mammoth Hot Springs, and we could hear them, you know, crying at night, which was music to our ears. But as they say, you know, the wolf, the, when the beavers did not have any predators, <clears throat> and they started um, gnawing more, and, you know, the saplings and the little, the trees near the banks, just so you were talking about the caribou or the moose, um, it, it impacted you know, everything is impacted when you take away something. I'm talking to ecologists here, so I don't need to talk about that. But anyway, the kids were fascinated because we um, we did all kind of art activities surrounding drawing wolves and origami wolves and, and handouts about, the, you know, the biology of the wolves. And, and then we, to culminate it, we want, and this is something that I would like to share with any teachers, you know, in pub, in schools that are K through even 12, we culminated by watching, you know, a, a fun, having a fun combination with watching White Fang that was a Disney movie in the 1990s, which is very emotional. It appeal, it's even, it's even better than the original, to me, book by Jack London. And um, it really had a lot to say about you know, wolves. And another thing that was very good at the time, have you all seen the documentary Wolves at Our Door and Living with Wolves by the Dutchers? Have you all seen that? No, but I'm no. going to write that down. <laughs> okay, write it down. <laughs> Living with Wolves and Wolves at Our Door. And it's Living about, with, okay. it was, I, I also showed that to my older students. And it is absolutely fascinating. And it was in the Sawtooth Mountain Range in Idaho. And um, so this woman worked, I think, at the National Zoo. And the man was a photographer slash he had been a kind of a dude ranch uh, cowboy, if you will. Very sophisticated couple, though, higher order thinking skills. And they met on an airplane and that was the beginning of their friendship, which turned into a marriage. And and then their passion for wolves uh, played out. And I think you'll really enjoy watching that. I think you can watch it on YouTube for free. Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I just found the link. I'm going to put it in the chat. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, the music is real cool. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to say that. And somebody was saying, what, you know, make your reference to why do people have this perception? Well, think. As an art teacher connected to the arts, I, I was telling my students, we are conditioned from childhood, you know, Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. I mean, it's a mindset that people don't even know really that they're being, having pushed on them with the concept of the Big Bad Wolf and, oh, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's, you know, and how they eradicated wolves in Europe in certain areas. Um not that they've been totally successful. I know that they are still there in Eastern Europe, I guess more, but, but anyway, you know, as a society, there's, um, we, we need more of what I had in college. I was at Agnes Scott College and <clears throat> they had a lot of visiting, oh, folks that came around for different reasons, for different causes. And one of the most fascinating events of my college life is when I don't know the name of the group, but it was some society to preserve the wolf and they were biologists and other folks. And they had a wolf that had been um, unable to live in the wild because of an injury. I don't remember what happened to the wolf, but they're so smart. It didn't take long for the wolf to be rather compliant and, uh, and pretty easy to handle. And they had that wolf with them 
a very large animal. And they had a, you know, that was before PowerPoints. It was just a slideshow about all about wolves. And they brought this wolf and walked it in and out of the rows of people. And some people got up and left and went to the back of the room. But I mean, I was in, just in wolf heaven. And and that for me, that was actually a highlight of my life. I, I mean, I'm serious. Their presentation was so convincing. And I would like to see if we want to have wolves reintroduced here with the denser population and all the at, you know, the, oh, the holy cows, you know, that take precedence over everything. <laughs> but it would be great to have some kind of educational program such as that. And also for schools to have, you know, like I was saying, an interdisciplinary program that brings the arts together with science, which carries the message a lot stronger. I'll shut up. I'm sorry I talked too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, you're good, Nancy. You talk as long as you want. You might say that. <laughs> All, right. All right. Um, anybody else wanna um Jessica, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yes, maybe no. Sorry, I haven't um <laughs> I actually haven't looked at the questions in a while, so yeah, but I it's, it's, it's well. Yeah, but it did make me wonder. Um, sorry, I, I'm having issues because I have progressive now. <laughs> okay. um, I guess I just wonder what my area would look would look like if we had an apex apex predator. Um, it's what really made me think about, and I really wish I could see the red wolves that I think are in North Carolina or. That's that would that be our local wolf? Yeah, and uh, from what I understand, um, they're uh, it was a, it's a place close to the coast of North Carolina. Um, it but there was still a lot of issues with um, people killing shooting them because they think they're coyotes. Um, they just had a hard time, <laughs> yeah. Um, and just not not that many left at all. I know that um, reflection writing in Chattanooga. Um, I think earlier this year, or may, it may have been last year, um, uh, some red wolves were born in captivity. Um, I don't know what I haven't updated on that lately. I've seen them in land between the lakes, but that was when I lived in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting. Every once in a while, you know, little dumpster fires that pop up on social media. Um, some I'm in a group um, about the, the Bankhead National Forest here, and somebody will make a comment or make a post, you know, saying, oh, we want to release wolves out here. And, you know, I, I, I'm sitting there thumbs up but then you think of landowners and people are oh you know some people think these conservationists are crazy what are they talking about you know putting wolves out here in our forest um you know it's it's interesting because like somebody there was a bear sighting um close to smith lake a couple of weeks ago and people just they're not ready for it that's why we need this consciousness shift like they I was seeing these comments like shoot the bear, kill the bear, the, every, you know. A lot of education would have to happen before something like that happened. I also yeah. try not to take to light uh, comments on social media just because social media yeah. makes money off of making us angry. So uh, that is so true. You know, yeah. They're not algorithms, they're ang anger rhythms. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, the, I, that chapter helps uh, you appreciate how there's a, a really balanced everything. It's not just one aspect of nature. It's a whole web that you understand all the workings of it, then you kind of appreciate it more, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I can throw out a question here. I have the, um, 
Well, I guess I, I can just review a little bit. So the each session that we had previously came with a key concept and the key concept for thinking like a mountain um, is humility. Um, Leopold's own misdeeds led him to be very concerned about the impacts of those with good intentions, but incomplete information. According to Leopold, blind pursuit of success, or as he describes it, paradise needs to be viewed cautiously. Um, and that's also something when we talk about, that's a key word when we talk about wilderness management, humility and restraint. You know, it's uh, whatever actions we take in a federally designated wilderness um, should be done with humility and restraint and not for human convenience, but for the preservation of wilderness character, a more holistic viewpoint of how we um, see a wilderness area. Um, but let's see, we have a few questions here. Um, I'll read the first one and see if anybody has any aha moments. Um, politicians are often criticized called flip floppers for changing their minds or, or positions on issues. However, it is critical for scientists to be able to do just this, sometimes referred to as a paradigm shift. Can you think about a time when you personally learned more about a subject and that your earlier assumptions were incorrect, you were able to consciously change your mind about something? I'll jump in and say what I shared with you about my experience in college with the group that came around to educate people. That was my epiphany. I'd always loved wolves, just instinctively, pun intended. <laughs> But, but that group nailed it for me and filled it. And I was passionate every day after that. Nice. Um, for me, I know that um, learning about prescribed fire was kind of an aha moment about, you know, basically about how, you know, just because it's a forest doesn't mean it's a, a functioning ecosystem. Anybody else? Mine was a little bit uh, in reverse, so to speak. By that, I mean, <clears throat> I grew up in a city. And uh, so I didn't have an appreciation for the rural life. And, but I did have an appreciation for environment and, you know, studied it in college. And the first earth they hit at the golden moment, I was like 20 years old and in the streets and setting my career in environment and did it for 11 years, you know, and on rivers. And, uh, but when I came to Auburn, crazy enough, but almost 40 years ago, uh, my department was in a college of agriculture. So suddenly I was confronted with some really good work and good people <clears throat> committed to uh, helping the rural life and communities and obviously food production. And so it had it had kind of an epiphany. I don't know if you'd say reverse, it's still positive, but it kind of went from rabid tree hugger to having a much greater appreciation for people in the landscape. <laughs> and uh, and then my work overseas with tribal groups and seeing subsistence level agriculture and what it takes and you know their views on wildness and predators and all that so there's always the balance that's where the humility comes in <clears throat> yeah and um just reading thinking about my own personal experience uh my path through wilderness um you know when i first learned about the wilderness act 15 years ago perhaps um i i was kind of uh i i inherited a narrative that is very um just wilderness act centric like it, it was the wilderness act is a place is untrammeled by man man is a visitor who who does not remain 
And that is what I taught to other people, um, not understanding that the greater perspective of that, that was more of a, a white person's response to colonization and then a pushback through a romanticism and then people feeling like they had to get back to nature in response to industrialization but that entire that that is one perspective though but what it doesn't what i i'm coming to learn in the last several years is indigenous perspectives on the wilderness act and um how and this was one of the central themes at this conference that i went to and conference that i went to in montana in 2023 is that um it it was just the wilderness act to them is um a, a, a just another way of um it's just not their perspective i mean they had been on the landscape for tens of thousands of years and when when we have this idea of preserving lands that are wild i mean they they never really were pristine you know previous previous to colonization um as a matter of fact like indigenous peoples don't have a word for wild um this is something that i learned earlier this year that that when we say wilderness or wild, like it's something separate from humans, that they don't have that concept in their, because they're, everything they do is so, I don't want to say living off the land, they live with the land. They had their own struggles, of course, in agriculture and whatnot, but um, that consciousness shift, you know, my earlier assumptions I took the Wilderness Act literally, and from what I was fed, the narrative that I was fed when I first got into conservation, and now, 15 years later, it is a, a lot more diverse and more robust than just a wilderness area is a place that is untrammeled by man, you know, um, so I guess that's one of my, you know, earlier assumptions, and then it's certainly changed since then. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just still talking about wolves and you had shifted to wilderness. Sorry, I answered the wrong question. <laughs> no, hey, if you answered a question, then <laughs> it doesn't have to be a right or wrong or, you know, whichever question. That's that's fine. Cool. <laughs> sorry, it's all good discussion. <laughs> um, anybody else have anything to add to that? Okay, we'll we'll find. Let's look at another question here. The second one. Um, this essay identifies many different perspectives: that of the wolf, the hunter, the rancher, and ultimately the mountain. Leopold is challenging the reader to read landscape from the mountain's perspective. What does that mean to you? I think it's kind of a, for some reason, I think of it as a holistic perspective because it's kind of sees everything that happens to it. It's like an all observant participant, all observing participant. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, on the present omniscient. Um, yeah, it's there over long periods of time and it, and it's affected and sees how all the different, uh, aspects of the environment i guess in the end how the absence of wolves really damages its surroundings and it it's able to view things over time but i never it's kind of interesting to read and identify with the mountain it's an interesting viewpoint I don't know if 
Leopold had it in mind, but I agree with Jessica. It's certainly a much longer term, you know, perspective because uh, the mountain far outlives any wolf, human, or ran rancher, or hunter, or whatever. But <clears throat> maybe he knew, maybe he didn't. Even mountains are constantly changing. <laughs> so everything is cycling. And our Appalachians in the east and in the Sipsi are, are little nubs compared to what they used to be. They're ancient, ancient mountains compared to young mountains like the Rockies, you know. So even mountains cycle and uh, erode and then uplift again. So there's there's cycles on uh, many different timescales. And at least that's something that comes to mind when you ask the question about thinking like a mountain to me. <clears throat> and I, it's it's funny how that, a lot of what Leopold has said has um, become part of my language. Like um, when I when I quit, you know, I had a green fire moment or somebody will say something and I'll be like, now you're thinking like a mountain. <laughs> Um, because you know it's 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 timeless it is that um opening of your mind um and seeing things more broadly uh checking our oh we're doing good on time and I, and I will have to say Jessica thank you for suggesting that we go ahead and discuss because I feel like I'm getting back on the bike maybe my critical thinking skills are you know post-covid I'm we're um it's working my brain a little bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank thanks for doing that. And it, you know, again, it's unfortunate that um Jim couldn't join us this um evening, but I'm gonna do this next summer again and see what kind of fresh perspectives we can get with all of the Zoom security. <laughs> And I, yeah, I, if y'all were on that session, I just, I was so terrified, heartbroken, traumatized, like every word you could think of, um, embarrassed, just, yeah. Um, and I apologize that that happened and I blame myself um, for not having the security settings set the way that they should have been, so well, I really appreciate you for doing this book club and I think it's a great idea and it, it actually, it means a lot to me to have something to, to be a part of, especially if you're in a remote area and it's a subject I care about, obviously. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I, I've been thinking about doing it again, but i um, not sure exactly which book I would like to use. Um, some books, it's just I was thinking Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, but that that is a really thick book. Um, I would have to just pull, and I, I need to go through it and see if there's like standalone chapters I can pull out of it. Um, but okay, let's see. We have two more questions left. Um, Leopold describes the power of seeing the green fire die in the wolf's eye. But he didn't understand until many years later why his actions felt wrong. Have you ever done something you thought was right but regretted it later? Oh, my entire life. <laughs> um, what what made you realize you were mistaken? <laughs> did you say? Did you ever do something you thought was right and later regretted, or thought was wrong? R wrong. And if I said right, I may, I may have. Wait, have right. you ever done some? No, it, it does say that. Have you ever yeah. done something you thought was right? Maybe they <laughs> mistyped that. <laughs> no, okay. I think what they're saying is he did he think it was right to shoot wolves, or are we at oh, the point I where he just, saw yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Saw the fire going right. out of the eyes? You know. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking, um, 
from what I remember, uh, so he thought he was doing a good deed by getting rid of the wolves, and then he realized that he wasn't. Yeah. I'm trying to think of something r relatable in my life with that. Um, I got nothing. Well, I'm sure there's something. Was it saying that <clears throat> he thought it was right to shoot wolves, but uh, and even when he saw the fire go out of the wolf's eyes, it still took him a long time to process that? Is that the question? I wasn't quite sure. Like, is do you think that's the intent? Like, it took him years. He didn't have an epiphany like right there where he dramatically changed, or did he? I, I don't remember. But it sounded like it took him some months or years to process that that event of shooting that wolf. Yeah, and I just um, copy and pasted the question into the chat if anybody wants to deconstruct it there. Um, yeah, I think it, yeah, I don't think, and I, you know, it, I don't think that's the way it happens with anything really um usually when i'm thinking i'm doing something right i'm i'm in uh full forward hubris mode you know and i'm just oh i'm doing everything i'm doing this right and if somebody were to come along and say no you're doing it wrong i would probably react um you know a little defensively maybe when you're caught up in the moment and that well, I, I know that's how I operate sometimes. Um, I'll and then in retrospect, two weeks, two months, two years. It's it usually takes a little while for that to um, sink in, and then um, yeah. I have a subtle example. Uh, I know I, there might be a few of real life examples, but the only one that comes to mind is. Uh, I kind of feel bad for pulling so many dandelions in the past. <laughs> like, oh, we got to get rid of these weeds. They're so ugly. But I learned to appreciate dandelions a little more so I don't remove as many. I mean, I may occasionally remove a few, but. <laughs> oh, I, I totally agree. I, I used to pull dandelions and then I realized how good the greens taste when sauteed in butter. <laughs> That used to be my favorite breakfast when I had chickens, a little bit of scrambled eggs and sauteed dandelion greens from the yard, you know, completely talk about local. <laughs> um, I was at a park and um, just to see the opposite end of the spectrum, I was at a park in Poland last year and the whole park was just dandelions in the instead of grass and it was actually really beautiful. So it's another way to look at things. Yeah. Well, you know, they say that uh, I've heard this saying, weed is in the eye of the beholder or because people say yeah. weeds, you know, um, or are they wildflowers? Um, I, used, I used to know somebody that stood her ground about having mm -hmm. she lived in the city limits and they gave her a really hard time about turning her front yard into wildflowers and they wanted to fine her and, and everything. And she just stood her ground. They're, she's like they're not weeds they're wildflowers <laughs> i kind of i made a redefinition of weeds for myself as for me a weed is an invasive whatever is an invasive plant in that region mm -hmm. so, another way i look at it now <laughs> well yeah it's funny i'm gonna piggyback a little bit talk about non sequitur non sequitur i, I want to you made me think of something I, i've been sharing in the last couple of years about invasive plants um because we i mean even i used to say you know i hate privet i hate mimosa i hate i had so much hate for these invasive plants but i'm reshaping the language with that um because those invasive plants although they don't belong here they still hold some traditional ecological knowledge somewhere um you know the mimosa is used in asia for certain things and 
um, so so now like when we take people on um, invasive plant removal days in the wilderness um, I'm, I have people recognize that um, is that you know it it has a plant it's a plant and it has its purpose somewhere it doesn't necessarily belong here um, so I try not to get um, uh, too negative about the invasive plants so that was a total non sequitur but <laughs> um, okay so let's we got about nine minutes left let's see what this last question is um, I'll I'll go ahead and copy and paste it and put it in the chat so y'all can look at it. All right. So at the end of the essay, Leopold seems to be asking if complacency or safety will ultimately result in danger and that wildness is a type of reminder that people cannot or perhaps even should not try to control everything. Do you agree? And you know, this uh, just right off the bat, this makes me think of, um, you know, when, in land management and wanting to operate with humility and restraint, but at the same time, we have humans have has altered the landscape so incredibly so that it's inevitable it's inevitable that we have to step in and control a little bit but not everything finding that striking that balance between leaving something alone but at the same time you know we have to go in and and burn because fire suppression has done so much to the landscape um and we need to step in and, and do certain things and have fire management plans. And um, so, yeah, we, we definitely um, have to do something, but not a whole lot. I don't know if somebody maybe would like to, re I was looking at the last paragraph of that section, actually. I don't know if someone has a book would like to yeah. read it maybe. I mean, I can read it, but I'd give someone a turn because <laughs> it kind of seems to answer the question. Okay, you said it, so you have to do it, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get used to these glasses here. Okay, we all drive. We all strive for safety, prosperity, comfort, long life, and dullness. The deer strives with his supple legs. The cowman with trap and poison. The statesman with pen, the most of us with machines, votes, and dollars. But it all comes to the same thing, peace in our time. A measure of success in this all, sorry, a measure of success in this is all well enough and perhaps is a requisite to objective thinking, but too much safety seems to yield only danger in the long run. Perhaps this is behind Thoreau's dictum, in wildness is the salvation of the world. Perhaps this is the hidden meaning of the in the howl of the wolf, long known among mountains, but seldom perceived among men. Wow. What a wordsmith. <laughs> And what's what's so fascinating about the way Leopold wrote is that it, it's so prescient. And there's there's the word it's it's wordy, but it's not like some books that I have sitting up here on my shelf that you get so bogged down. Somehow he just knows exactly what to say. Um, you know, not too many big words that a lot of people that might not relate to i mean it's just it's very relatable but at the same time very powerful i guess that's what i'm thinking it kind of reminds me i think i saw on bill's website did you mention that nature is very competitive and that it needs that wildness to kind of thrive 
Where was that now? I thought I saw uh, on maybe you you have a website. I do. Yeah. It, and I, it does I, have, Yeah, I'm. I don't the, recall. Yeah, it may be a different website, but. I would concur. <laughs> um, so Steve, was it Steve Jones? Because Steve Jones has been on a lot of these. Oh, maybe. website. Something about how, uh, like the forest thrives in competition. That that nature is very competitive and kind of um, not vicious, but aggressive. Like it's going to strive to grow and succeed where it can. There's competition between trees and, but that's sort of the way it's always been. It's the na nature needs its own wildness to be balanced. Uh, that's what it kind of reminded me of that passage. Mm -hmm. All right, Nancy, Russell, y'all have anything? before we slide in here to the seven o'clock mark? Well, <clears throat> my name, and first I'll be quick. Um, the thing about complacency, I don't want to read too much into this, but <clears throat> it's in safety. I think that is an enemy of justice and environmental protection and human rights. When people, and we see it now, when people can see things right in front of their face that obviously break the rules of polite society or civil society, that they are fearful to, and maybe like I said, if I'm reading too much into this, please stop me. <laughs> but this is just where my thought process took me, you know, because of their need to be safe and to they, they fall into complacency because it's much easier not to make waves, even though waves need to be made. So I'll just stop there and see if that's... No, that's I like that. It frustrates me very much. <laughs> there, there is no overthinking in conservation or, <laughs> or just contemplating conservation. Um, so... Overthink as much as you like, Nancy. You're doing a great job at it because I know that um, I do it too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to a fault. But thank you for the encouragement and validation. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dad always said to me, you'd overthink a stop sign, which is pretty true. <laughs> Are you an Overthinkers Anonymous? If not, I'll give you the phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> give me a minute while i overthink that <laughs> all right you know i would just very briefly mention you remember kim the first session that we did we had buddy from the yeah leopold do you remember his organization that he was from yeah um the aldo leopold foundation yeah Okay, so I'm up in Wisconsin this summer, and I told my wife, I want to I want to go see Buddy. Well, we corresponded, and he said, oh, come by, but unfortunately, I'll be gone the day or two that you have to be here, but I'll arrange a nice tour. So I thought, oh, that's cool. So we're driving from Minneapolis to through Wisconsin, and I did not check the name. And so in my GPS, I said, take me to the Aldo Leopold Center. And it took me to a preschool. And so there's all these little kids running around. And I said, is Buddy here? And, oh, who's Buddy? You know, that kind of thing. But, oh, you're talking about the foundation. Well, you went past them about 40 miles ago. Oh so, no! Yeah, I was I was within like a half a mile of where they were, but I went to the Aldo Leopold Center. Oh and no! So you know, I I was mildly disappointed, but we walked a trail. They had a beautiful trail, <laughs> and this mink came out in front of me. I hadn't seen a mink in years. Oh, wow. I thought it was a weasel. He was kind of a <laughs> young mink, but um. But just to let anybody know, you were correct in saying the foundation. 
not the center. So <laughs> Leopold gets high honors up there in several organizations. So it's good to know which one you're going to. Right, right. Um, well, and then there's the Aldo Leopold Research Center in Missoula, Montana, which I always I always get those confused with the Arthur Carhart Har Arthur Carhart Center, which is also in Missoula. So yeah, um, and I'm I'm sorry you missed that. Uh, you know, when I was up there for the Leopold Land Ethic Conference in 2015, um, I I got they opened the shack for us, so I we actually got usually it's not open for the tours, so I got to go yeah. inside and and um yeah it was great yep. for, in the building there the um the center is um very much like i would love to see if if we build something for wild alabama um model it after that somewhat it's almost completely solar and it's one of those that i can't remember what the accreditation is but um it has a lot of um Oh, what am I trying to, what's the word? That's one thing about COVID, words elude me. I was just like so low hard. impact development or sustainable right, right, building. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, all right, you guys. Um, mm -hmm. It is 7.02 and my beautiful dog is snoring and I'm already wanting to snore with him. <laughs> I, I've been sleeping a lot. I've been sleeping about 12 hours a night, 10 or 12 hours um, with this whole COVID business. Um, so I guess I've been needing that for healing. Um, but again, Jessica, thank you for um, encouraging this. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that we had this discussion. I think I needed it. Um, we needed it. The, earth, the world needs it. Um, so now I will have the recording up and the, the missing piece of the puzzle will be there and the six sessions will be on YouTube in perpetuity. Um, <laughs> so great. Um, Y'all stay tuned. Um, we've got a lot going on with Wild Alabama. Lots of events, lots of fun stuff. Now that it's cooling off, I know I'm going to be getting outside. So, all right. Well, without, yeah. okay, y'all have a good night. Thank yep. you. Thanks Bye. so much, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.